at the time you took those vows, mm -hmm. did you think that would be a forever thing? Yes. And yet your heart was fooled, yes? There was yeah, something yes. that you were. And so you now know <clears throat> that it's possible for a person to go into a marriage with the very best of intentions, mm -hmm. intending to be a forever thing, and yet be deceived. And if a prenuptial agreement, and I don't like them, yeah. but if they might protect someone who is vulnerable and could be mm -hmm. deceived, could it not be a good thing in some situations? Well, I'm not quite sure how a prenuptial agreement would protect me per se. I mean, when I got divorced, in the, and I got divorced in the state of New York, and I'm saying that because I know in every state some of the divorce laws are different, and women in different states are eligible for different things. What happened to me was the fact that I had a degree um, actually worked against me in the state of New York. Um, it was actually told to me if I did not have a degree and if I was poorly educated, I would be um, eligible for the maximum and even maybe even more so. But you could have theoretically put something in a prenup. I mean, but what, what would I well, be well, Let me suggest something. I don't even know if this is doable. But I would agree with the concept of prenups if they could somehow fix what I think is wrong with marriage vows, which is they're not enforceable at all. Let's face it, you get married now mm -hmm. and you could change your mind a year from now, 50 years from now, for a reason, for no reason. There are no negative mm -hmm. consequences for someone leaving a marriage. Could you do a prenup in a way that essentially makes it a covenant marriage that puts fault, that says, if there's going to be a divorce, we're going to have the following fault factors in determining our divorce, contrary to what the custom of the law is. Could you do that in a prenup? Could you specify that if someone commits adultery or does things, that could you write that up in a prenup? Yes. So you could actually protect an innocent party in advance. Yes. Yes. I mean, I've had work? agreements where I've uh, addressed those issues, yes. But what is the outcome? Like, what is the point of putting that in? Well, the point of putting it in is so that the wrongdoing party cannot then benefit from the divorce or the, uh, you know, the parting of the ways. In other words, you don't want to have a party uh, commit marital misconduct and, and at the same time be able to leave the marriage and benefit from it. So you can put provisions in that agreement to protect that situation. But doesn't divorce in the state of New York automatically protect that person to some degree? I mean, in other words, when you get divorced um, and you have a legal document, what takes precedence, your prenuptial agreement or the divorce? Like, I, which law? Well, if we you have a validly with? executed prenuptial agreement, that's mm -hmm. going to control. Okay. And if, you know, taking a situation where someone's already been divorced, let's mm -hmm. say, and uh, they, they've been hurt financially, mm -hmm. uh, and now they go into a new relationship, uh, it's important for them to feel that there, there's some protection mm -hmm. for them uh, in the case of a dissolution of the second marriage. So I, I think that, you know, the agreement does serve a valid purpose. Again, it goes back to the intent of the parties in, in originally getting involved with the agreement, how they do it, and what's in it. Is it fair or isn't it fair? Oh, I have a question for you about what's validly uh, executed. This, this is, you know, I, I think it's not clear always what's, here's my, I have a hypothetical question for you. Here's my hypothetical. Hypothetically speaking, okay, my goal in life, one of my goals, is to meet and to marry a, a wealthy woman in her 90s who has a heart condition. <laughs> <laughs> now let's say I meet this woman, but it doesn't turn out as planned. Uh, I fall in love with her, hopelessly in love with her, and I cannot bear to be, this wealthy elderly woman turns out to be my soulmate, who knows? And I, so I, I ask her to marry me, and she says, Mel, you know I have money, I first insist that you sign a prenup. I'd be devastated, first of all, but I feel I would have no choice. I would sign a prenup, and then to continue the hypothetical, two years into the marriage, this woman of my dream says to me, she says she was never sexually satisfied in the marriage. And it's very painful to me, and I'm not going to talk about the details of my personal hypothetical life. <laughs> but I'm devastated, and she, and she files for divorce, and she invokes the prenup. Now, I'm telling you, if this happens, the first call I'm making is to the law firm of Jerome Whistleman. And I'm going to tell you the following. First, when she had me sign it, she held an emotional gun to my head. I had no choice. It was under duress, but also, it was fraudulent. I thought she wanted me to sign it to protect her. If I left, here she's leaving me. So there was no true love here. And I'm going to say, Jerry, can you break it? And I, I want to know if you're going to be able to break this agreement. Well, um, the, first of all, both sides entering the agreement should have representation. So 
if uh, one side doesn't have representation, that's certainly a basis upon which to attack the agreement later. Secondly, the agreement has to be fair when it was made and not unconscionable when it's trying to be used. And uh, that's a very, very significant test. But she wasn't going to marry me if I didn't sign it. Isn't that in and of itself coercive? No, it was your choice to get married under those circumstances. I was in love, Jerry. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was hardly a gun to your head, but... Uh, it's funny because that's what, uh, you know, Rose was on a previous show and I asked yeah. her that question, whatever happened to love? Well, yeah. whatever happened to love? Here yeah. we go again. <laughs> See, I think we wouldn't. Here's the irony. Yeah. And I, I'm struck with this irony. I don't know if this... I, I think that the only reason that prenups are necessary is that, you know, frankly, we don't enforce nuptial agreements anymore. So that, you know, I think if, if you know, we wouldn't need the prenups if we would just enforce, you know, the nups. I mean, seriously, yeah. because the prenuptial agreements, if you had the protection of a marriage contract, why would you need the prenuptial yeah. agreement? Well, you understand? Well, yeah. I think, I think yeah. the marriage contract should come with an automatic prenuptial now. I really do. In New York City, I don't know if you know this, maybe, Jerry, you don't know this, uh, the marriage licenses, now you have to get counseled about domestic violence if you get married in the city of New York. I think there should be a mandatory warning label on a marriage certificate yeah. that says, stop, do not go further unless you know you can get sent to the cleaners financially. Well, that's like saying you can't have children unless you've taken several courses because there are people out there having babies and they were not trained to be parents. Well, maybe they so should be that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can actually too. take everything. There, you know, there are many step. different circumstances under which you can enter into a prenup. You could be uh, both young and, and never have been married before going into a marriage together, which is, I think, a little more what you were yeah. relating to. Mm -hmm. You could be uh, already, both uh, people could already have been divorced uh, and have had uh, marital obligations uh, arise, or divorce obligations, let's say, arising out of that first relationship. And uh, business is already established later in life, uh, uh, maybe uh, professional uh, degrees and so on and so forth that are valued in New York for marital purposes. And uh, when people get older, they have much more to consider in that regard. Oh. And again, as I say, if you could provide that during the marriage things be done fairly, it's not really going to be too bad an agreement. But when I got married to this hypothetical woman, I thought it was true love, and it turned out not to be true love. She was using me. And I mean, aren't there ways to, to just say that there was fraud or duress? I mean, you know, our... Well, how it sounds like what you're saying is you want a prenup agreement that says, if I find out if my spouse lied to me, yeah. I want to be protected. But also, what are you getting out of it? Are you looking for a financial... Um, compensation. Um, what I are you think they're inherently for? signed under. I think that there's an, some inherent coercive aspect to any prenup. And Jerry is saying, and he's making a valid point. No one really forced me to get married. I yeah. chose to get married. But um, how does it? You know, I'm really interested in this. We have a lawyer here. How does it work with a division of property? Because I think the whole question of prenups really challenges the I, our idea of marriage. You've mentioned to me that the, there's a time element, and the longer the marriage goes on, the more a person in some ways invested in the marriage. But here's what I think, and tell me where I'm wrong in this. I think that a marriage involves you marry your fortunes together, and the very next second after you take your vows, the very next second, she owns 50% of everything the two of you own. Why is that wrong? Why is there, why is there some element about, about you know, if it's a 10-year marriage, if it's a 50-year marriage, why is it not as soon as you take your vows, that's it? Well, the problem is then if in you know, the next week she decides the, the marriage is not for her, then uh, if, if everything were 50-50 after a week, but not marriage. in a fault based that system. If there was a fault based system where she decided, then she would. But suppose, suppose Roy, is, you know, you're worth what, $50 million? Yeah, right. Yeah. Suppose, <laughs> suppose Roy marries her and leaves. I mean, the point is that, that isn't the theory, I mean, what am I missing here? Isn't the theory that when you get married, you're sharing everything, not just what you have now, but what you've ever had and ever will have, right? But I, think, I, think, I think it hasn't been addressed yet about the archaic. Laws. Let's face it, Jerry, I think most of the people, uh, your clients are men, aren't they? Yes. Okay. So that tells me something that men know that they're taking to the cleaners because they see the Donald Trumps, they see the Jack Welches from GE, they see them all getting raped over the coals and, and $30 million going out the window. Now, those men are rich men and they can afford it. But most of the average guys out there, they can't and they get, I know men who are sleeping in their mother's basements and their mother is 80 years old. They've been taken to the cleaners. They've ruined businesses, families. They've had uh, child alienation against the children. Uh, 
everything that you can imagine. And why shouldn't they protect themselves? Why should? Isn't it the laws that are the problem here that they're archaic in this day and age? I know they protect.